Thank you all, and thank you, Mary, and uh, Vanessa, and Charles, <laughs> my son, for, for being so um, insistent about getting his uh, mother here. But I am more than delighted, and I'm more than delighted as well, to have a, uh, students who are actually studying ecclesiology and Mariology. So you're the sort of ideal um, group to, to speak to. So um, I am very pleased. So Mary and the Catholic imagination. It did not start as a pilgrimage. It began instead as a longing to circle back to my home place, which is the city of Los Angeles. It was as though at this specific point in my life, as a late middle-aged, empty-nested Midwestern co college professor, I had little choice but to home westward lured once again by the salty sting of ocean air and the sloping California coastal range. Home. The sights and the landscape that had early shaped my sense of belonging, they lured me. Soon, however, it became clear that this homeward visit was in fact a pilgrimage. Seated across the desk from an academic colleague at Los Angeles's Loyola Marymount University, I found myself asking, what about Mary in Los Angeles? And thus began a seven-year pilgrimage, visiting shrines, communities, parishes, all of whom were under the Marian patronage. During my last visits, I brought Omaha photographer Dorothy Tuma to create a visual record of what I experienced. My pilgrimage road threatened threaded through the car-clogged landscape of the Archdi Archdiocese of Los Angeles, at whose center is America's minority-majority city. It's the world's largest archdiocese. Los Angeles covers 8,762 square miles. It serves over eight, I'm sorry, serves over four million Catholics from 270 parishes located in 120 cities. The pastoral staffs of the archdiocese celebrate liturgy in over 80 languages. My pilgrimage took me in conversation with Catholics from very diverse cultural backgrounds and at all ends of the theological spectrum, and it plunged me into the intensely devotional milieu of performative piety. Although I might have looked for her in any Los Angeles or any American city, Los Angeles was a particularly apt place to go in search of her. That sprawling, magnificent, and often tawdry West Coast urban environment is not, strictly speaking, the city of the angels. By official founding proclamation, it is the village of the queen of the angels, or depending on who you talk to, the village of Our Lady of the Angels. The angels may have come to stand in for her in common discourse, but that does not negate the fact that this city really belongs to her. Nor does the name alone identify it as a Marian place. Here, Mary is really palpably present, and she has been from the very beginning. What I first came to realize was that there are a seeming infinity of Marys. She's visibly present and liturgically present in her, her, sorry, in her dogmatic form, for example, as the Immaculate Conception and the Assumption, but she also is known in scripture in the way she's depicted and as she is venerated in private prayer in the Rosary or the Litany of Loretto She's held up as beloved patroness of nations, of ethnic groups, cultural and particular locales. Her healing prophetic powers are recognized and her intercession is requested for every imaginable personal and collective heartfelt cause. Certainly I am not the first contemporary scholar to concern myself with Mary. The, the bibliography for that is huge. Or to go on pilgrimage with the hope of encountering her. Yet in the final analysis, it is Mary's devotees, those women and men in the archdiocese under her patronage, with whom I have spoken and prayed, who have been my best teachers about Mary. 
As a scholar who concerns herself with spirituality, I align myself most closely with what you could call lived experience, especially the experience of persons who struggle to live out of the part of themselves that yearns for ultimacy and who are shaped and changed in the process. That there is such a thing as the Catholic imagination, and I'm not sure this is the right picture. Is the first assumption of this exploration. I conceive of the imagination as a central human capacity that is crucial to perception itself. We need our imaginations to see what is familiar and to see what is unfamiliar. In addition, the same capacity of imagining is utilized when we interpret patterns beyond what we perceive to grasp the depth and the nuance that is present in the world. Further still, we need the imagination to conceive the world as it is not yet. What we dream and what we imagine is not fantasy, but depth, completion, and fulfillment. Different individuals, and especially different communities, possess distinctive imaginative lenses through which we perceive and evaluate their worlds, and through which they register the hoped of the human heart. Roman Catholicism, obviously, is one of those communities. During my L.A. Marian pilgrimage, I have come to see four aspects of this Catholic imagination poignantly expressed. And did you already see that slide? I don't have a way of looking at it. There it is. OK, OK. During my uh, pilgrimage, I have come to see four aspects of this Catholic imagination poignantly expressed. First, the Catholic imagination is profoundly sacramental. Put very simply, this imagination concedes the possibility that both time and space open out into the infinite and the eternal, as well as the possibility that the created world, by analogy, gives expression to that which is uncreated. Second, and this follows from the first dimension, the Catholic imagination is very visual and embodied. It emphasizes seeing, and is enacted in gesture, ritual, and performance. Third, the Catholic imagination stresses both the common good and the particular. The individual cannot be fully realized except in the context of community, and the community's common good is focal. At the same time, the local and the particular and the limited are also of intense and essential focus. And fourth, the Catholic imagination, I believe, is paradoxical and ironic. It holds together impossible tensions of opposites. There's unity and diversity, hope within tragedy, and grace in the midst of grief. And it is really at this fine point of those tensions that I find and discovered on my pilgrimage Mary poised. So I'm going to spend a few minutes um, exploring several of those um, aspects of the Catholic imagination in terms of Mary. So, a sacramental imagination. On the feast of Our Lady of Guadalupe, the city of the Lady of the Angels is awash in flowers. The festivities begin at dawn on December 12th with Las Mañanitas, the little morning ritual in which she, who is the white dove, the rose, the beloved one, is wakened with songs. During the daylight hours, churches are alive with devotees who travel on their knees the length of the aisles toward images of Guadalupe or sit quietly in pews, breathing in her presence. Lush bouquets adorn formal altars. 
Makeshift altars are set up outside to accommodate the throngs that gather to bring their own flowers and their candles and their gifts to the profusion. Nor is it the feast alone that is observed. There are preparatory novenas and triduums in many parishes and an annual archdiocesan procession for Guadalupe that draws tens of thousands to East Los Angeles. Early December is truly sacred time in the archdiocese of LA. In the Catholic imagination, time and space are not homogenized, but instead they open out into a sacred reality that is the heart, at the heart of everything that is. The Virgin Mary's presence in sacred time, whether she is recognized as Guadalupe or under another name, com commands a place in the popular devotion that is really well beyond her ascribed role within the theological and liturgical confines of magisterial tradition. But Guadalupe, there's more of the Guadalupe, is not, of course, the only virgin who commands the attention of her people at singular times in the archdiocese. The Filipino communities of the region have great devotion to their many miraculous virgins. Here we have Peña Francia, and there's Our Lady of Perpetual Help. There are festivals among this community that abound throughout the year. These celebrations are matched by the Eastern Rite Catholic churches that hold dear the August Feast of the Dormition of the Virgin. Thus, for example, in the village of El Segundo, the Melkite and Russian Greek Catholic communities take to the streets on the 15th, bearing the silver-framed icon of the Mother of God. Similarly, on the vigil of Mother's Day in May, the various communities of Chinese Catholics converge at St. Bridget's Chinese Catholic Center in historic downtown Chinatown for the festival of Our Lady of China. And December 8th, the Archdiocese is alive with the veneration of Vietnam's Our Lady of Levang. A sacramental imagination assumes that the visible world can be an expression of the invisible reality that sustains us. So in addition to sacred times, there are set aside sacred spaces created by and for the intense veneration of Mary. In the heart of East Los Angeles, hidden among a maze of one-way avenues, is the Guadalupe Sanctuary. This jewel box of a church is just an astonishing, astonishing place. It was founded in 1929 as one of the small communities designated for Spanish-speaking Catholics. The image of La Virgen Morena is everywhere visible. Above the altar, she stands alone upon a sliver of a moon surrounded by the rays of the sun, her black belt of pregnancy visible beneath her prayer-folded hands. On either side of this central image are scenes from the story of her encounter with the Aztec peasant convert, Juan Diego. But Guadalupe is not the only virgin who commands her own spatial realm. Our Lady of the Rosary of Talpa, who is the beloved patroness of Talpa de Allende in the Mexican state of Jalisco, has her own parish in East Los Angeles, as well as her own miraculous story. Nor is this a phenomenon restricted to what are sometimes referred to as ethnic images of Mary. I think of Immaculate Conception Parish near downtown LA, with its utterly unique sanctuary windows completed in the mid of, middle of the 20th century. These depict Mary's varied, various reputed apparitions over the past thousand years. Our Lady of Mount Carmel, of Noc, Fatima, La Salat, and so forth. Whatever one might think of apparitions, and we can talk about this later, this sanctuary celebrates the imaginative possibility that the material world is radically open to the realm of the divine. Similarly, scattered across the archdiocese in a series of black volcanic stone grottos replicating the appearance of Mary at Lourdes, is a, this series was constructed by Ryoko Fusokado, a Japanese-American Catholic who was incarcerated in the internment camps during the Second World War. He had vowed to construct a Lourdes shrine each year after he gained his freedom. 
And so there are quite a few of them across the archdiocese. The point here is not only the rather obvious one that the Virgin Mary occupies large temporal and spatial swaths of the Southern California landscape. Rather, it is to suggest the depth of the religious imagination that would recognize the power of sacred time and space. Not merely illustrative or pedagogical or memorial, such a sacramental imagination opens up the possibility of personal and communal transformation, healing and renewal, all of which can be anticipated in the encounter with the sacred. There are any number of scholarly studies that have described the significance of Marian shrines and devotions for immigrant communities. Marian incarnations such as the Cuban Caridad del Cobre or Guadalupe, Peña Francia, Lavang, they are all cherished by those who find themselves in an alien land or as part of marginalized or minority status groups. The narratives and the rituals that occur around the virgin who is patroness enables practitioners to negotiate the psychological and spiritual shoals against which life has often battered them. To speak more theologically, there's uh, Carida da Cobra. Oh, there are some wonderful ones, okay. The Catholic way of imagining the world is profoundly incarnational. Thus, even as the divine and the human are seen and not seen as identical. The intuition is that one can know and experience something of the divine by attending to human experience. Another way of describing this imaginative approach is to say that the infinite is encountered only in and through the finite. It is not simply that times and places are set aside to acknowledge the sacred reality or that the sacred might be encountered in time and space, but that the sacred presence cannot be experienced except in and through the material, the temporal, and the concrete. Of course, this deeply incarnational insight is not the only expression of the Catholic imagination. Divine transcendence or the ultimate otherness and unknowability of God is also part of our theological vocabulary. But that insight and its implications for Marian devotion is a topic for another lecture. And instead, I turn to a second feature of the Catholic imagination as I have discovered it in Los Angeles. Oh, there's some beautiful, there's a lovely annunciation. Talk about the incarnation there. So, second aspect an embodied and visual imagination. On any given day during the year, men and women, young and old, can be found in the, stim, the still dim interiors of Catholic parishes throughout the basin. They venture in alone or in small groups. They engage in scheduled novenas to Our Lady of Perpetual Help, or they reenact the Stations of the Cross. They rest quietly, heads bowed or circle these sanctuaries, genuflecting before statues of Mary and the saints and touching their feet. They prostrate themselves. They walk on their knees in gratitude, in reparation, and in adoration. They turn the pages of devotional manuals and they finger rosary beads. They pull small photographs out of jacket pockets and they press them into the base of a pieta or an image of the sorrowful mother. They enact private and collective gestures, both small and expansive. The Catholic imagination is quintessentially a visual one, and it is fundamentally about embodied ritual. It is a performative and practiced faith. It is, of course, true that Catholics do affirm many propositions and adhere to creeds. But it is really ritual practices, I would maintain, that historically and in the contemporary world both shape and reflect the Catholic imagination. And the Virgin Mary, 
is the center and the focus of a vast number of these different formal and informal embodied rites. On a Wednesday evening in summer, I make my way off the main streets of Glendale to the neighborhood in which Holy Family Parish is nestled, where the weekday evening mass will be followed by a novena to Our Lady of Perpetual Help. This novena has seen an incredible resurgence in the area during the last 20 years, largely spearheaded by the vibrant Filipino community. During the service, which takes place each week and acknowledges that Byzantine-style perpetual help as a maternal refuge and comfort in times of trial, faith is embodied in this communal rite. There are a multitude of performative Marian celebrations that take place in LA. The Easter dawn Salubuang pageant, another Filipino favorite, involves processions of the life-size images of the risen Christ and his mother. For the duration of the Lenten season, the Marian image is worn a black veil, but as Easter morning dawns, the grieving mother is carried to meet her triumphant son, her black veil of sorrow stripped away and replaced by a white veil of joy. Filipino and Vietnamese Catholics have also revived the block rosary, a devotional practice in which a statue of the Virgin is carried weekly to a new home where a group rosary is prayed. Such rituals, obviously, do build community and cement cultural identity. But I think the imagination beneath these is much deeper. The gestures themselves and the imagery, statues, paintings, and all, are not nearly depictions. They allow access to the reality that they depict. If the material world is the medium through which the immaterial is manifest, then it makes sense that seeing that visual faculty should be privileged in the Catholic scheme of things. The omnipresent visual images in Catholic churches and in private devotional use speak to this intuition. These visual depictions should not be construed primarily as being simply catechetical or pedagogical. And there are a whole list of wonderful scholars who have demonstrated the power of religious images that elicit striking human responses. I think of David Morgan and um, particularly uh, his recent work. People may be aroused by pictures, Sculptures, they break them, they mutilate them, they go on journeys to them, they are calmed by them, they're stirred by them, they're incited to revolt by them. They give thanks, they expect to be elevated, and they're moved to often the highest levels of empathy and fear by imagery. The lure of images resides not only in their promise of continuity and renewal, but also their promise of transformation. That lure answers to a deep human longing which it is the business of religious belief to engage. The act of looking thus can be formative. This visual as an axial aspect of the Catholic imagination is key. One of my favorite pilgrimage pastimes was to read the visual stories of LA churches I visited. Um, if I can find St. Cecilia, here she is, yeah. Located just south of downtown, the imposing Romanesque style St. Cecilia Church contains striking examples of the visual fecundity of Catholicism. It also illustrates the way that past history is visible on a community's structures. I know liturgical specialists will probably cringe at this, but I love multi-layered uh, communities or structures and, and churches that, that show everything that's happened in them. To the left of the main altar in this sanctuary, which was first erected in the 1930s, is a Marian altar. You see it here. The original fresco illustrates the 1858 appearance to Our Lady at Lourdes, which of course was a seminal and representative focus of Marian devotion through much of the late 19th and early 20th century. This is located underneath a traditional European-style statue of Mary as Our Lady of Grace. 
She's got her arms extended in welcome. The altar below is crowded with devotional artifacts. To one side is a white-mantled Our Lady of Fatima statue, which was ubiquitous in LA during the 1950s at the height of the Cold War, when she was implored to save the world through the conversion of Russia. And then a framed reproduction of the very familiar Our Lady of Perpetual Help, which was originally promoted in the early 20th century in the Archdiocese by the Redemptorists, and as I said, it was recently re revived by the Filipinos, hangs on the wall to the left. And in the center, which virtually obscures the Lourdes fresco, is a glass cabinet containing an ornate image of Nuestra Señora de Joaquila, a devotion recently imported into the Archdiocese by the Indios from Oaxaca, who venerate this small, brown-skinned virgin. Visual imagery is and has been central to the Catholic imagination as are ritual gestures, processions, and rites. As I have peregrinated throughout the archdiocese, there was, there was Fatima. She shows up sometimes, but she, she hardly shows up the way she did in the 1950s. Oh, this is a great picture of her um, <laughs> 1950s uh, consecration to Our Lady of Fatima at a grade school when everyone was um, praying for the conversion of Russia and such. Um, here we have another Guadalupe. OK. Um, no, I have to go back. OK, as I have peregrinated the city of the loss of the angels, I have had opportunity to encounter many of Mary's followers who speak of her apparitions past and present. Scholars have helped me see that some of this phenomena is linked to cultural stress and often arises as groups experience political and social change. And I probably should have stopped at the Fatima. An example might be a series of apparitions associated with, again, 1917 apparition at Fatima, which took on an anti-communist political overtones. But Guadalupe also is an encounter that continues to heal, empower, enliven, and give hope to millions of devotees. That she is experienced as having been and still being present among her people is really true. What is it that allows this? I think the crux of the question, and I look to Roberto Gorzeta in this one, is that there's an imagination here, and it concerns the specific cosmovision that undergirds many of the conversations I've had with people. Latino theologians describe the sacramental realism that is implicit in the sorts of devotional practices I have been part of in LA. Such Devotional practices embody an organic worldview in which the human person sees him or herself as part of a relational network and a temporal continuum that embraces all of reality, material and spiritual, so that non-empirical reality is not dismissed as irrelevant, but is factored into daily life through religious ritual and prayer. So here's our third aspect. <laughs> attentive to the universal and the particular. It's December 12th at Dolores Mission in the barrio of East LA. Pressed in between two family groups waiting for the service to begin, I find myself looking about at blooms that envelop the Guadalupe Shrine and the loops of green and red paper cutouts that hang from the rafters. You see it without the Guadalupe stuff here in the picture. There is, however, a very odd item that I can't explain. There's a lump of folded fabric that's placed on a low step before the altar. During his homily, the Jesuit pastor identifies this mysterious object. This bundle contains the sole possessions of a young man who was found dead in the barrio just a few days before. Undocumented, he apparently had arrived from south of the border not long before in search of work. And having no papers and no history here, he now had no name. Like so many impoverished and desperate young people, he had run afoul of someone or something in this gang and drug-dominated neighborhood. The tiny bundle containing everything that was found with the body has been placed before the altar to honor this boy 
with his dreams that must be common to every boy and to acknowledge his dignity as a human being and thus as a child of God. The pastor gives him the name Juan Diego because the Juan Diego of the Guadalupe story was, like him, a poor marginalized person who had been co-opted, his native land and his experience and his identity had been co-opted. Emphasis on littleness and particularity is, I think, a very significant dimension of the Catholic imagination. This emphasis plays itself out in a hundred ways in Catholic intellectual, social, and ecclesial life, in the option for the poor, the moral principle of subsidiarity, a preference for the virtues and vows of simplicity, poverty, and humility, a, I have to say, somewhat guarded tolerance for local cultural expressions of faith, and certainly a concern for the marginalized, the unborn, and the immigrant. This emphasis is in some tension with the equally strong Catholic instinct for the common good and for common worship and defining statements of belief. Nevertheless, the local and the limited and the particular have a very special place in the Catholic imagination. On the one hand, while Mary is acknowledged by the vast majority of devotees I meet to be a universal figure, she's also intimately present to individuals and to particular communities in ways that honor their distinctiveness. The Vietnamese know her as Our Lady of Loang. Did I go past Our Lady of Loang, or did I find her here? Yes, there she is, okay. Who first appeared in 1798, deep in the jungle forests, and who offered solace and healing to refugees fleeing from persecution. To Polish Catholics, she is the Black Madonna of Czestochowa, who first came to them in the 14th century and later protected the famous monastery of the Bright Mount, from the invading Swedes. Lebanese Maronite Catholics claim intimacy with her because, according to scripture, Jesus and his mother visited Lebanon during his private ministry, his public ministry. The local and the particular are recognized as cherished by the Virgin Mother who spreads her sheltering manor, mantle above those who turn to her. The scriptural Mary, of course, especially as she is seen in the Gospel of Luke, proclaims the significance of the little and the lowly and the poor. The Magnificat hymn that the Gospel writer has this socially insignificant expectant girl sing on her visit to her cousin Elizabeth is a hymn to the kingdom vision that would upend all unjust social arrangements and dignify those who are marginalized. Devotees of miraculous virgins and those who see in her appearances or her encounters a sign that the lowly are chosen also know this truth. The poor indigenous convert Juan Diego, the peasant girl Bernadette at Lourdes, the illiterate children at Fatima, these are Mary's chosen people, the ones to whom she inclines. At the same Dolores mission, where that small satchel of belongings from the anonymous Juan Diego was honored, there is a distinctive painting of the Virgin that hangs on the wall to the right of the main altar. It is titled, Santa Maria del Camino. If those of you who know the Jesuit Madonna, um, it's um, um, Madonna della Strada, uh, the Lady of the Way, and certainly this is Mary of the Way, right? Mary is depicted here as a young Latina with her serape slung infant, walking barefoot along the road, the skyline of downtown Los Angeles, as seen from the perspective of the barrio of East LA, is visible behind her. And if you'll notice, one of my favorite parts of this picture is that where she's walked, the way is smooth, but the way ahead of her is still um, got rocks and pebbles, but where she's walked, the way is smooth. This Maria is a celebration of the lowly, the little, and the particular. So our last aspect here, before we kind of see how she ties it all together, 
Uh, I think the Catholic imagination um, is really saturated with paradox and irony. One of the most remarkable aspects of this Catholic imagination, and it seems to me one of the most elusive in practice, is its wonderful capacity to hold together completely irreconcilable opposites in paradoxical tension. Most obviously, Mary has emerged in different, different ethnic and cultural groups with a face and a function that suits each group. For LA's Korean and Chinese Catholics, those originating cultures that hold up progenitors and value children, Mary's motherhood is key. For the Benedictine monks at Valiermo, at the foothill of San Gabriel Mountains, Mary is first and foremost the archetype of the contemplative, her ear and heart open to receive the divine word. Did I go by the, no, I don't have it here, but you can, an enunciation. Here we go, Armenian Catholics, fueled by raw memories of their own cultural genocide at the hands of Turkey, cherish her as queen of martyrs. And each Caribbean and each Latin American nation and many of their cities hold close their own miraculous image of the Virgin, whose beloved story speaks of her preference and of their particularity. Mary adapts herself graciously to her locale and the aesthetic tastes of her local admirers, and she holds all these disparate peoples under the shelter of her capacious cloak. And perhaps even more remarkably, her welcoming arms extend broadly enough to embrace Catholics in Los Angeles who span the ideological and theological spectrum. As suggested for many of the marginalized who love her, she tends to create an alternative world where human dignity is not tied to economic or social standing. I frequently had this Mary held up to me as a model of liberation, as the one who sings of the end of injustice or of the patriarchy, as the mother who advocates for her disappeared and abused children, and who is not afraid to confront the powerful and upend the status quo. But in contrast, and here's where this Our Lady of Victory comes in, I've had conversations with lay people and with pastoral staff in the region who view her as a fierce defender of traditional piety and a critic of secularism. Mary, for these devotees, is seen to stand as a sacred bulwark against the secularization decadence of the modern world. And in a harmonizing, if not identical, key, I have spoken with lay Catholics and pastoral volunteers who are devoted to a Mary who's the harbinger of a wrath that will befall a sinful world. For groups such as these, Mary, -er, Mary is warrior and boundary keeper par excellence. Most touchingly, I have discovered places in which she has played the creative role of peacemaker among her divided cultural and ideological constituencies. There is, of course, and I just went by, the classic figure of Guadalupe, who, while she was not understood to have been created by an artist, has been rightly identified as the new creation, emerging from the encounter of cultures in Mexico. She's a mestiza, neither an Indian goddess nor a European Madonna, and as such, she is the mother of the generations to come who will synthesize the richness from their parent cultures and construct a society in which the barriers between people are broken. But I have also discovered that Mary continues, continues to do her reconciling work in new and surprising ways. In a rather ordinary parish in Altadena, which was a wildly diverse community, like so many in the archdiocese, where the inherent tensions among parishioners who are in conflict with one another on the streets, African Americans versus Vietnamese versus Mexicans versus Filipinos versus Koreans, there was a young pastor there who found that the one common ground that these divided communities shared was their deep love of the Virgin. An elaborate Marian Congress was devised at Sacred Heart Parish, during which the disparate groups came together to pray multilingual rosaries, hear talks, and to display their varying personal devotional images. The healing that the parish rift 
experienced began with Mary. Throughout the archdiocese as well, there is iconographical evidence of her reconciling role. Of course, most prominent, and you, maybe some of you will be familiar with this image, this is sculptor Robert Graham's rendering of her at the new cathedral of Our Lady of the Angels. Here she's a youthful girl with racially unidentifiable features. She surmounts the majestic front entry doors, her bronze arms extended in welcome to all who enter. But the cathedral's titular Lady of the Angels is not the only image created to represent the melding of cultures and identities in this minority-majority metropolis. I discovered that the parish of Our Lady of Peace in North Hills, these are just ordinary parishes, another potentially fractious, diverse community, the congregants decided to honor their titular virgin by commissioning Los Angeles artist Lalo Garcia to create a fresco in which the Virgin's face might reflect the various populations that the church service, serves. The resulting Our Lady of Peace is once, once again racially unidentifiable, a girl clothed in bright fabric upon whose upturned hand flutters a dove. She is the common ground upon which the diversity of worlds meet. The paradoxical imagination is of necessity an ironic one, for it permits both joy and tragedy. Its fundamental aesthetic moves from grief and loss of innocence to consolation and forgiveness and redemption. God is found precisely in the ironic juxtaposition of hope and the experience of loss. So everywhere in the archdiocese, Mary as Dolores or Our Lady of Sorrows is evident. At almost every turn on my pilgrimage road, I've encountered her, her eyes upturned and weeping. She cradles the body of her dead son in the iconic Pieta. Shrouded in black, she presses her hands together in unspeakable anguish. She swoons at the foot of the cross and she bears her suffering in solitude. Mary's devotees migrate to these images. They bring offerings and flowers, ex votos, crumpled photographs of loved ones whose lives and flourishing hang by a thread. These images point not merely to her solidarity with those who suffer, nor to her consoling maternal presence, but to the irony that even in the depth of sorrow, the mystery of joy is incipient. There is nothing glib in this imagination. Our Lady of Sorrows in Los Angeles carries in her heart the unbearable grief of countless losses that have been left at her feet. On the evening of Good Friday, I venture across the thin rivulet of the Los Angeles River once again to Dolores Mission in the barrio of LA, of East LA. We are here for the Pesame service. Up front in the tiny church, the altar has been removed and this life-sized polychrome statue of the doleful sorrowing mother stands in a pool of light, her eyes cast up and her hands clasped in prayer. Following a recitation of the sorrowful mysteries of the rosary, the pastory, pastor begins a meditation on the weight of sorrow that Mary carries. The lights in the room are low, the air is close, the mood is heavy. The priest draws us into the Virgin's grief with a first person narrative my son, my son, he repeats soulfully. When he finishes the meditation, sheets of paper and little stubs of pencils are passed, and we are invited to reflect on the burdens that weigh us. We inscribe them on our papers to present to the compassionate mother whose pondering heart alone can carry this grief. To the strumming of guitars, we make our way up the center aisle we pick up carnations and lay them tenderly at the feet of Dolores, along with our intimate sufferings. As the Pesame service concludes, community members share with the assembly what they have laid before her, 
The voices and faces of women who rise speak. My boy has fallen in with bad men. My daughter is very sick Whoop, let me go back. and dying. I go to the prison to visit my son, and I don't know if he will come home. The drugs, they find our children even on the playground. Here there is no pain that is isolated, no sorrow that breaks the heart that is held alone, no grief so stinging that it is not already known and born here in this humble shelter in the barrio of East LA, born in the wisdom of those present and perhaps most generously by the sorrowing mother herself. In her, one can glimpse the ironic truth that grief can ultimately give way to joy. Clearly, Mary occupies a richly textured imaginative space in the, in the Catholic imagination of Los Angeles. She's at the center of time and space. She's the guardian of the common good, as well as the marginalized and the powerless. She is visualized and honored by embodied rituals that usher the faithful into an encounter which empowers galvanizes, transforms, comforts, and intuits joy in the midst of sorrow. She is the shared love of a wildly diverse and often contentious community who find in her their common ground. As I have traveled my pilgrimage through the archdiocese under the protection of the Lady of the Angels, a provocative phrase, le point vierge, the virgin point, continued to haunt me. There's a caveat, I have to say, that sometimes the concept of virginity, while it's a stunningly fruitful spiritual metaphor, has sometimes over the centuries been used oppressively to denigrate actual women and human sexuality. And yet, despite the narrowly conceived theologies that may have imprisoned her, still, I find a deep down freshness a liberating energy in Mary, and the phrase le point vierge captures what I sense. Oh, there we have the 1950. Oh, how did I get over here? No, I need to go back to le point vierge. I'll, I'll stay here for a minute. I first discovered the provocative phrase in the works of the late Trappist monk, Thomas Merton. Merton had taken the phrase from the Islamic scholar Louis Massignon, who in turn learned of the idea of le point vierge through his study of the writings of Al-Halaj, who was a 10th century Sufi mystic, who taught that the point vierge was the secret place in the center of the human soul to which God alone has access. This virgin point, or as some have translated it, a virgin heart, was the goal of the Sufi mystical process of removing layers or veils of one's heart. The point of contact beneath the layers of the heart was le point vierge. Merton, riffing on this central teaching of al halage learned it from Massignon, who used the term in the context of interfaith encounter, interestingly. This French Islamicist was, the, was convinced that there was a need to cultivate a virgin heart as a prerequisite for encountering other religious traditions. What was needed, he believed, was a complete reversal of the current attitudes, middle of the 20th century, toward other faiths. What was essential was a radical hospitality in which the other could be truly met, and this could only take place if one lived out of le point vierge. From his cloister, Thomas Merton carried on a lively correspondence with Massignon, and he became fascinated with the idea. He used it in a number of different ways. For him, le point vierge is both a spiritual reality, a location, as it were, of the ineffable encounter of human and divine from which all else has been emptied. It's also a state of being where at the center of human nothingness, one finds the other. 
both the religious other, the stranger, and the divine other, God. The virgin point, then, is thus the in-betweenness that returns one to the fresh possibility of recreation as well as a non-discursive experience that takes one to the very edge of that which is unsayable and unknowable. As I have walked my Marian pilgrimage, that phrase has continued to haunt me. In the first place, as I said, I've been struck by the astonishing number of Marys I have met. These multitudinous images, that's a Marian, here we go, um, images seem not to trouble most of the people with whom I have spoken. Thus I find her a central, powerful, and integrating symbol in the complex Catholic world. She's rich and polyvalent, multi polyvocal, and she has sufficient flexibility to appeal to and respond to many different constituencies. Of course, there are central Marian dogmas, and there's a long tradition of Marian reflection, but these seem in practice simply to fold into the varied attributes and roles with which her faithful endow her. The tolerance for holding together in one signifier, Mary, this vast panoply of names, faces, qualities, capacities, functions is really quintessentially Catholic. In this sense, then, she is within the faith community, a point vierge, an in-between reality where the diverse hopes and aspirations of many converge. I see in her a creative potential an imagination which, while continuing, refining, and clarifying itself through structures and doctrines, also refuses to be reduced to those clarifications. Alive, inbreaking, generous, and unpredictable, Mary waltzes back and forth from center to the periphery of the tradition and back again, choreographing a dance into which everyone is invited. Next, Le Point Vierge is the place where the other is truly encountered. Merton, who, if you remember your Merton, met all those folks at the corner of 4th and Walden in Louisville and experienced Le Point Vierge there, and Massignon, who opened his Catholic heart to this Islamic world, affirmed this. This has certainly been my experience in Los Angeles. I came to this feeling when I visited Our Lady of Peace in North Hills, as well as in Altadena with their Marian Congress. She became the mediating presence who facilitated an encounter with the strange and formidable other. She became the common ground that enemies shared, the common ground of meeting and reconciliation. She likewise has become my own personal common ground, the point of encounter between myself and others in my church community with whom I share little beyond my affiliation. But there's even a deeper encounter, and then I'll close with this, in which I experience in Los Angeles Mary as the virgin point. There's something about the way my conversation partners describe her and their relationship to her, no matter what their perspectives, there is a poignant tenderness, a palpable hopefulness. There was really no reason why all these people who talked to me should have been so forthcoming and so revealing of the depths of their love and their longing, except that perhaps they sensed that I share the same. They didn't speak catechetically to me, nor to impress me, but out of their deepest hopes. She seems to represent, or perhaps even more provocatively, to be present at some deep, resilient space in the human heart in which newness and possibility generate. Beneath the veils that cover the heart, beneath our fears and our views and our ego-driven ideologies is a space, a virgin space, not in the sense of absence of ambiguity nor pure because it denies the vagaries of the human heart, with its very cruel and destructive capabilities. But a space so poised at the edge of unknowing and the unsayable 
that the outer layers that cover our hearts are peeled away and yield to silence. This is a point, I think, where the stranger is encountered in the full mystery of otherness, a point where tensions meet and not resolved still create new possibilities. This is the threshold where the divine other invites us. At this point, the heart breaks open and what remains is mercy, grace, forgiveness, reconciliation, hope, beauty, and beauty, and more beauty. Thank you very much.